Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at the complex root case. And just to put things in perspective, uh, we first started out with the real roots. And then after that, which was the previous video, we looked at imaginary roots. And in this video, we're going to look at complex roots. So imaginary roots were of the form uh, plus or minus a times i. But this time, we're going to be looking at complex roots, which are the form a plus or minus b times i. So we have a real component now, in addition to an imaginary component. And then in the final case, which will be in the video after this, we're going to look at the repeated roots case. So anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at this example right here. Uh, so we have a constant coefficient homogeneous second order linear differential equation. And just like we have been doing for these types of equations, we are going to assume that y is of the form e to the r times t. So we can differentiate this twice, get expression for y prime and y double prime, and throw it back into our differential equation. And that'll give us our characteristic equation. But instead of writing all that out, I'm just going to go ahead and pull off the coefficients. So we get 2r squared plus 4r plus 4. So I, would just, I just went straight into the characteristic equation by pulling off the coefficients. And so we see that this doesn't look like it's going to factor, but that's OK. We'll just use the quadratic formula. So we have negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 16, minus 4 times 2 times 4, so minus 32, all over 2 times a, which is 4. And this is going to be equal to our r1 and r2. So let's go ahead and reduce this. We get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 16 all over 4. And I see I have a negative under the radical. So I'm going to go ahead and factor out a negative 1 and write that as an i. So we get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 16 over 4 times i. And this obviously reduces to negative 1 plus or minus. We get 4 over 4, which is 1, so plus or minus i. So these are going to be our two roots, r1 and r2. So let's go ahead and write out our first solution associated with the first root, which comes out to be e to the r1 times t. So we said that r1 was negative 1 plus i times t. And then let's go ahead and write an expression for y2, which was e to the r2 times t. So this is going to be equal to negative 1 minus i times t. So we have our two solutions, y1 and y2, which are associated with r1 and r2, respectively. So the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to rewrite this in terms of its real components and its imaginary components. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to factor out an e to the negative 1t from both of these. So we get e to the negative t times e to the i times t. And here we get e to the negative t times e to the negative i times t. And the reason why I can do this is because when we multiply things with exponents, those exponents just add. So we can see that these are actually equivalent. So now I want you guys to recall Euler's formula, which said that e to the i times some theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i times sine theta. We're going to go ahead and use that to expand what we have in parentheses here in order to get rid of this imaginary. So y1 becomes e to the negative t times cosine of t plus i times sine t. And we have y2. This one becomes e to the negative t, our coefficient or our theta is going to be negative t. So we get times cosine of negative t plus i times sine of negative t. And since cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function, I'm going to rewrite this again as cosine t minus i times sine t. So this is going to be our y1, and this is going to be our y2. But again, we are not happy yet until we get rid of all of the imaginary parts. We still have an i right here and an i right here. And we don't want those because we want to express our solution as a real solution. So just like we did in the pure imaginary case, I'm going to define two new solutions that I'm going to form from y1 and y2. So I'm going to say, OK, let's let ya be some constant c1 times y1 plus y2. And then let's go ahead and let yb be another constant, c2, y1 minus y2. And again, the reason why I want to define two new solutions like this is because, well, first off, this is going to be, y a and y b are going to be valid solutions because they are linear combinations of two valid solutions, y1 and y2. But also, the reason why I want to do this is because I want to isolate the real components 
of uh, the two solutions and using using YA, and I also want to isolate the imaginary components using YB, and that will let us absorb any constants and any imaginary uh, eyes into our constants so that we can express it in real terms. So the first thing that I noticed is that Y1 and Y2 both share an E to the negative T. So I'm just gonna go ahead and immediately factor that out right here in the beginning. So I'm gonna say C1 E to the negative T uh, times Y1 plus Y2. So we get cosine T plus I sine T and then plus Y2. Okay, so we see the I sine T's cancel leaving us with C1 E to the negative T times two cosine of T. And let's go ahead and do the same thing down here. Uh, again, Y1 and Y2 both share this E to the negative T, so I'm gonna factor that out in the beginning. So we get C2 E to the negative T, and then Y1 cosine T plus I sine T, and then minus cosine T, minus a negative is a positive, so we get plus I sine T. And here, this time, the cosines cancel out, allowing us to isolate the, the imaginary components. So this is going to be equal to C2e to the negative t times 2i times sine t. And so this is what I was saying. I was saying that since we have an arbitrary constant C2 and C1, I'm just going to let it absorb any other scalars that we have. So I'm going to, I'm going to say 2i. This, is, this represents a scalar. It is imaginary, but that's okay. Well, let's go ahead and absorb that into our C2 constant. And similarly up here, let's go ahead and absorb this two into our C1 constant. So these two solutions are going to be our new solutions that we are going to use in order to express our final solution. Okay, so let's just go ahead and express our final solution as YA plus YB, where YA and YB are both valid solutions. And just to remind you guys, the reason why we need two solutions is because we have two roots. And also the way that we define YA and YB ensure that these two solutions are linearly independent, which is good. So anyway, we determined y a and y b to be c1 e to the negative t times cosine of t plus c2 e to the negative t times sine t. So I'm just going to rewrite this by factoring out an e to the negative t as c1 or e to the negative t times c1 cosine t plus c2 sine t. So this right here, we're going to take as our final answer to this differential equation. And we can actually use this to develop a general case for, a, for complex roots. So in the case that we have complex roots where our roots are R1 and R2 equal to A plus and minus B times I, when we have complex roots like these, we can develop a general solution form that looks like this. E to the negative A times T times C1 cosine of b times t plus c2 sine of b times t. So this represents the general form associated with complex roots. So in our case, we had r1 and r2 is equal to negative one plus and minus i. So here our a was negative one, which is reflected right here. And also we had a one uh, as a b, which is reflected by this one times t and one times t right here. So we can see that, th that this does match our general form. So typically, whenever I see roots like this, complex roots, I just I just go straight into uh, this general form right here. And one of the things that I would recommend looking out for is, is make sure that you don't leave off this term. It's easy to forget. And it's very important that this term multiplies uh, the entire quantity of the cosine and sine functions. Because really what this represents is either a decay or growth of the amplitude of this sinusoid right here. And in fact, whenever you guys start modeling second order systems like mass spring dampers and stuff like that, you'll see that complex roots, whenever we get complex roots, that's usually indicative of the existence of some sort of friction or damping in that system. And that's because we get this real part right here, which actually represents a decay of the amplitude of uh, the sinusoid. So we'll get like a graph that looks something like this that'll decay due to friction. But anyway, that's that's something for a later video. So anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys later. Oh, also, if you guys have any questions or want to see more examples or anything, just let me know, leave it in a comment and I will get around to doing it.